A friend of mine told me the story about a girl that she met from Sweden who stayed with her for a while. The girl was in her mid-twenties, and we'll call her Jane. Jane was driving to her mother's house one late evening. She lived far away from the city in a heavily forested area. There wasn't any streetlights on this road, and not a lot of houses. The few houses that were built were back in the forest and had long winding driveways so you couldn't see them from the road. As she was driving, something up ahead on the road caught her eye. It was a small bundle on the side of the road. As her car passed the bundle, she was shocked. It looked like a baby wrapped up in a blanket. Jane slammed the brakes, stopping about 50 meters up the road. She reversed and then jumped out of the car as quick as she could. As she was thinking that someone had abandoned the baby on the road, Jane ran over to the bundled up blanket and exhaled a sigh of relief. It was just a toy baby. Just as she had made to pick it up, she saw headlights coming down the road in front of her. Suddenly realizing that she was standing on the road alone at night, she ran quickly back to her car, jumped in and quickly started the engine, and then drove off. The car behind her sped up, coming really close to the back of her car, honking its horn at her. Jane was now panicking. She started driving faster and faster, constantly checking her rearview mirror. Although she couldn't see who was in the car behind her, she was still terrified. Eventually, she reached her mother's driveway, which was still about two miles long. Her mother lived deep into the forest. She thought to herself that if the car followed her down the driveway, she would call her mother and tell her to ring the police. And as she turned onto the driveway, the car behind her followed her, still very close. She kept thinking back to the baby toy and how creepy the evening had been. Jane got out her phone and called her mother. She told her that she was being followed and to call the police. She was expected to arrive in about five minutes. Both cars were going way too fast for that tiny narrow dirt road. There was no street lights, so all that Jane could see was what was being lit up by her headlights and the headlights of her pursuer. She then saw her mother's house in the distance of her headlights. The car behind her was still very close, still blaring their horn so loudly Jane's ears began to ring. As she got to the house, she jumped out of the car. Her mother was standing at the front of the house, waiting for her with a kitchen knife in her hand. The car that was following her also stopped, and the car doors flew open. An elderly couple got out of the car and started shouting and pointing at Jane's car. Someone got in your car! They screamed. That's when Jane realized what happened. A man jumped out of the backseat of Jane's car and ran into the forest. Everyone just looked at each other in shock. The car that was coming down the road had seen someone jump into her car when she stopped to check the baby. It was likely that the man had left it there on the road and was watching for people to stop, taking advantage of people's kindness. As I said at the start of this story, a friend of mine told me this story and I believe it to be true. If anyone else has heard of this, please leave a comment down below. And always remember to lock your doors whenever you get out of your car. This happened to my sister about 15 years ago when she was still in high school, and I was in middle school. Our mom worked as a house cleaner and always became friends with everyone's home she would clean. One of the homes was owned by an older couple who had no kids but had a huge house and a really nice pool that they would always invite me and my siblings to come swim in. The husband worked as a COO of a large airline company, and they lived in a very nice neighborhood on a large lot surrounded by forest. When you were in their backyard, you couldn't see the other houses at all, just trees. It felt very secluded. Their house was very angular and architecturally interesting, with multiple levels made from stone. Pretty much every room had huge floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the backyard and gave great views during the day. At night, however, the reflection from the inside lights prevented you from seeing out, so it was always a bit unnerving to walk by them since you couldn't see what was out there. The couple also decorated with old Native American art and masks, which was a little creepy to a middle schooler, but the couple were very nice and not so creepy, so I never got too scared. They had an older golden retriever named Samson that lived up to his name, as he was massive but had a sweet and gentle temperament. They also recently rescued a husky mix named Sadie, who was the polar opposite, Psycho Sadie, as we so lovingly called her. 
She had intense separation anxiety, and she would destroy their house whenever they left her inside, jump their short fence if they left her outside, and if they took her with them to run errands, she would destroy their car and howl non-stop until they returned. So since they were wealthy and had extra money, they would pay for me or my sister to come over and dog sit while they went out. We got 20 bucks an hour, so we were always excited to go over there and watch cable and swim in their awesome pool. Normally everything would be fine, and both dogs would usually just lay around. But occasionally Sadie would realize that I was a stranger and go nuts and start barking at me, and I watched her eyes literally turn red. I was convinced that she was going to attack me, but she eventually calmed down after I got up from the couch and showed her how big I was. <laughs> not. But I digress. This particular incident happened over Easter weekend, while the homeowners were out of town for two days. They were paying my sister to stay there over the weekend, and I stayed with her the first night, because it was a big house and kind of scary to stay there all alone. We stayed up late watching movies and eating junk food. The next day we swam in their pool and hung out, but for some reason I didn't spend the night again, and I'm so glad I didn't, because what happened that night scarred my sister for life. It all started when my sister was working out on their treadmill. Their workout room was on the bottom floor of their home, which was a walkout basement. Just outside the room was a huge sliding glass door that opened to their patio and pool. She had the TV on in their workout room. As she was running and watching TV, she thought she heard the house alarm beep like it did whenever the door was opened. She stopped the treadmill and went to look around and saw that the sliding glass door was opened. Now this door was huge. There was no way it could have opened by itself. So she was instantly freaked. However, the dogs were just lying there in the workout room and she figured that they would have gotten up to investigate if someone had come inside. And because Sadie was a bit crazy and hated strangers, she thought that she might have accidentally left the door open and just imagined the beep of the alarm and that it could have come from the TV or the treadmill. She closed and locked the door and went back to working out. A couple of minutes later, she had the distinct feeling of someone watching her. She looked around, but no one was there. She finished her workout, but couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. She decided just to go to bed as she was becoming a little creeped out and just wanted to forget about it. She went around and made sure all the doors were locked. The owners didn't give her the alarm code so she couldn't set it. She took a shower and locked herself in the guest bedroom with both dogs, just in case, and eventually fell asleep. A couple hours later, she awoke with both dogs growling at the door of the room. Now, it was fairly normal for a psycho Sadie to growl and bark for no reason, but Samson had never barked or shown any signs of aggression. So immediately, my sister knew something was up. She was shaking and trying to convince herself that the dogs had just heard an animal and that it was nothing. But then she heard the dreadful door alarm beep. She called my dad in a panic, crying and screaming, and he told her to hang up and call the police as he was on his way over. She called the cops, and my dad made the 15-minute drive in just under five minutes. When she opened the bedroom door to let my dad inside the house, the dogs took off running and barking through the house and downstairs to the basement. My sister ran screaming all the way through the house to the front door to let my dad in. He quickly took a look around the house with his gun, but did not see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later and looked around the property. They found that the back gate was open, as well as the sliding glass door again, but not enough to let the dogs out just barely a jar, like it had been slammed shut and bounced back open a bit. They said it looked like someone had entered the home through the sliding glass door because the lock was tampered with, but they determined that whoever it was hadn't stolen or disturbed anything. When my dad asked why someone would break in and not do anything, especially with the dogs locked up, the police said that they had been notified by the homeowners earlier that month that the husband received a death threat because of a decision that he made at his job that put a lot of people out of work. They had gone to the police about it, but didn't bother to tell my sister to keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Needless to say, we never dog sat for them again, and they moved out of state within a few months because the husband lost his job. And if you ask me, he deserved it.
During my first and only semester of college, my very good friend Jake was dating this girl Stacy that we knew from high school. For reference, I'm a female and was 18 at the time. I'm now 26. Now, many people back in high school did not like Stacy, and I was one of them. To me, she was the definition of a sketchy person. She was a pathological liar and not even a good one, as her stories rarely added up, and she would constantly contradict herself, sometimes within minutes after she spouted her lie. She was one of those girls that hated drama, yet it always seemed to magically follow her around everywhere she went. She was constantly in and out of relationships throughout high school, and would go out of her way to prove that they were crazy by spreading rumors about them and getting as much sympathy from everyone around her as she could. She always had to be the center of attention wherever she went. I remember during prom night, she was dancing with her then boyfriend, and he accidentally stepped on her foot while dancing. She caused a huge scene about how he was physically abusing her. It was painful to watch. There's much more I could get into about this chick, but in general, she's just an extremely toxic person who nobody should be subjected to be in the presence of. It's also worth noting that she had a drug problem that she would often try to hide. This will come into play later. Anyway, back to the story. Jake and Stacy had class together and hit it off rather quickly. Jake was skeptical at first, but when Jake brought up her reputation in high school, Stacy claimed that she was raped by her ex-boyfriend, and that was why she acted the way she did, and that she worked on getting better and was now fine. My friend being incredibly insecure about being single and being way too trustworthy believed her and began dating her soon after. The relationship was extremely dysfunctional and was rampant with emotional abuse and manipulation on her end. But the aspect that I want to focus on was her constantly trying to squeeze money out of him and her aforementioned drug problem. Stacy would constantly ask Jake for small amounts of money, usually ranging between $10 and $20. Jake didn't mind all that much, as he bought into her story of struggling financially, so he felt bad. But one day, she asked him for $500 to cover her rent, to which he refused. She flipped out on him, and didn't talk to him until she drunk dialed him late that night, and began revealing that she was doing drugs, and it was all because of how terrible her life was, and that he wasn't helping. I don't know why he didn't break up with her then and there, but the next day they talked it out and made up and the issue was dropped. Here's where everything finally comes to a head. It was around 10.30ish on a Friday night. And keep in mind that they have been dating for nearly two months at this point. I'm chilling in my living room with another friend of mine. We're sitting on the couch bullshitting about stuff going on in our lives when I get a call from Jake. Jake explained to me that Stacy was hanging out at her friend's house and asked him if he could come pick her up around midnight as the buses in that area stopped running after 8, and she needed to be in work at 9 the next morning. He said sure, and as the time he needed to leave to pick her up drew closer, his mother called him saying that she was working overtime and wouldn't be out until around midnight, and she had the car. He asked if I could drive with him to go pick up Stacy. I'll admit that I would rather have left her to her own devices, but he sounded desperate and he's an amazing friend who would do anything for me, so I did him a solid and told him to start walking over to my house. He gets to my house about 40 minutes later. My friend went back to her house. She lived across the street from me, and Jake and I got in my car. He texted Stacy and told her that we were leaving now, and that I was driving him to which she said the dreaded K. We got to Stacy's friend's house, which was located on the outskirts of town in a pretty sketchy neighborhood. The road was very poorly lit, and to my luck, the streetlight in front of Stacy's friend's house was off. I refused to park in front of there, as I didn't feel comfortable sitting in the dark. So I parked three houses down, between two cars under a functioning streetlight. Jake texts Stacy, Hey, we're here. She didn't respond. As we were waiting there, a truck drives by, and I notice about four men in the truck. At first, I figured maybe they were lost and looking for an address, but this thought was thrown out the window. When not even two minutes later, the truck drives by again. This time slower, the guy in the front passenger seat makes direct eye contact with me as the truck passes by my car. I tell Jake something is definitely wrong and to call Stacy so we can leave. He agrees and calls her. It's dead quiet outside, so I hear the conversation. She answers and says, Hey, where are you? We're down the block. Come outside. I'm looking outside and I don't see your car. 
We're in my friend's car. It's a gray Subaru. And almost immediately after he says that, the phone call drops. Jake just looks at his phone in complete confusion, wondering what the hell is going on. I'm starting to get extremely nervous now. Between the truck that was circling around before and Stacy's sketchy behavior, I decide that something is up. I'm not just going to be a sitting duck. I pull out of the spot and drive up in front of the house. And as I'm pulling out, I hear a vehicle loudly in the distance behind us. I look in my rearview mirror and see the truck from before now quickly driving up the block. I freak out and floor it out of the spot and begin speeding up the block. The truck catches up with me and Jake yells at me to turn and that they're trying to shoot the car. To my horror, I look behind me and the guy in the back seat is leaning out the window with a gun in his hand, aiming at my car. I quickly turn and floor it down the road as they struggle to follow behind us. I made another turn left, narrowly missing an oncoming car, and I slammed on the gas. Luckily, I'm halfway down the block by the time they turn onto it. I'm surprised I was driving as well as I was at the time. Jake said I looked extremely calm and determined during all of this, but inside I was freaking out. I was worried that they were going to run me off the road, or we were going to get a bullet in the back of our skulls. I made another left turn and drove like a bat out of hell towards the highway. The truck turned on the block, but then stopped when I got close to the highway. I turned onto the highway and merged into the next lane. A few minutes passed by with us going back and forth questioning on who those guys were and what they wanted. When Jake gets a call from Stacy, he picks it up and puts it on speaker and shakily says, Hello? Where are you? I'm fucking waiting for you. She screams. He explains the situation, to which she proceeds to call him a liar and says that he was never there and he was standing her up. Jake loses his shit and screams at her that we almost got killed and calls her out on her bizarre behavior throughout all of this. She starts yelling again, but then she goes silent and we hear a door quietly open and someone calling in the background. They got away. Stacy, where the fuck are you? Silence follows this for a few seconds before the line goes dead. Jake and I look at each other and Jake said she had something to do with this. Long story short, we spent the entire drive theorizing on why this happened, and we think we may have hit what happened. Jake brought up her asking for money before, and when she asked for $500, she probably needed the money to pay off a dealer. She had to find another way to pay off her debt. We think that she set us up to head to that house, and those guys who were probably the dealer and his buddies would conveniently show up, looking to rob us of everything and possibly jack the car hoping that it would cover her debt. She probably thought that Jake was using his car, not realizing that we were actually using my car, which explains why they circled the block in confusion, and why she hung up the phone immediately after Jake gave her a description of my vehicle, as she possibly called the dealers to update them. I dropped Jake off at his house and went home. I know people say that after scary encounters they always are shaken up and their emotions are running in a million directions but I was just emotionally drained. It felt like I just couldn't feel anything, and I wanted to go home and go to bed, which is what I immediately did when I got home. I filed the police report the next morning on those guys, and they said they would look into it, but I never heard anything from them after I filed the report, so who knows what they've been up to ever since. As far as Stacy goes, our theory was further solidified. When Jake saw her in class on Monday, where she approached him and berated him for Friday night, claiming that she walked all the way home and had her phone and wallet stolen by some druggies. Jake basically called her out on that whole night, claiming that she set us up to get robbed, to which she denied and called him crazy. He told her that they were done, and she just yelled, Fine! and walked to the back of the room. The druggies were probably the dealer and his friends, who robbed her to cover the debt. To our surprise, she never attempted to contact us again and kept her distance probably because she knew that we were on to her and wanted to keep the heat off of her. After I dropped out, I never saw her again, and the last I heard anything about her was from Jake, who told me that she developed a long-distance relationship with some guy and dropped out halfway through the semester to move up north to live with him. As far as I know, that was the last time anyone ever saw or heard from her.
Overall, I'm happy I trusted my instincts and picked up on the fact that something was wrong, as this encounter may have had a different outcome. In hindsight, they most likely weren't going to kill us, but it's easier to say that after the fact, because at the time, we didn't know what their intentions were, and for all we know, they may have even planned to do more than just rob us. So Stacy and the four men in the truck, my life has been going perfectly fine since we met. Please do me a favor and don't ruin it by crossing paths with me again. This event happened to me back in the summer of 1989 on a remote speck of land in Pawnee, Kansas, back when I was 30 years old. It was early evening and the sun was setting. There was a warm breeze outside, which I remember clearly because I had just burnt a bag of popcorn in my defective microwave and had flung open the windows to air out the kitchen. I don't remember what I left the house to go and find, but after tossing the burnt bag of popcorn into the trash, I recall exiting out the back door and walking towards the barn. I remember hearing a noise off to my left in the field, like a faint cough, but I ignored it. My mind was focused on other things, and I wasn't even remotely worried about a complete stranger could have been wandering across my property. As it turns out, I should have been. When I exited the barn and made my way back towards the house, I stopped dead in my tracks as I made eye contact with a very large and extremely unkept bearded man, perhaps 10 yards away from me. Judging by the amount of gray on his beard, I determined him to be 60 or older. He was barefoot, wearing stained overalls in addition to suspenders over his bare torso, which struck me as being unnecessary and strange. While his body looked extremely worn down and tired, his eyes were wild and fierce, and full of hunger and malice. In his right hand, he carried a hatchet. And before I could form a sentence, I already visualized in my head how many steps it would take for him to reach me. I was alone, a vulnerable young woman, with no one around for miles to hear me scream, trapped out in the open by this man, who appeared to have sprung from the grass, blocking the path to my house. I'm not sure how long we stood there in silence, but I recall I was about to ask him what he wanted when the man spoke up. I remember his voice was much deeper and more elegant than I expected it to be. I'll spare your life for some whiskey. I stammered something, I don't recall what, and the man raised his voice and screamed at me. Whiskey! I took a reflexive step back, and the man started stomping towards me. He didn't raise the hatchet, but I'll never forget the hatred in his eyes as he closed the distance between us. That's when it happened. Blood exploded out of the side of his head, and he collapsed onto the grass, making a sound like a grunt as he hit. I might be remembering things slightly out of sequence, but I thought I heard the crack of a rifle echo after he fell, not before. I didn't stop to think or look twice. I sprinted for my kitchen, terrified that someone would fire a second shot at me. Once inside, I should have locked the door and called for help. But instead I grabbed my car keys, ran out the front door, climbed into my tiny red Volvo, and drove to the nearest police station. It wasn't until I spoke to the officer at the desk that I realized that I had blood splatter on my dress. Three police cars escorted me home, at which point it was long after dark. They combed the area with flashlights and discovered a large pool of blood on my back lawn, but there was no body, not even the hatchet. They set up a perimeter and expanded their search, but by the time dawn came and my husband returned, they had found nothing. No trace of the bearded man or whoever had fired the rifle. They asked me multiple questions about the man and the sound of the gunshot. I suppose they were trying to determine the caliber and perhaps deduce how far away the gunman had been standing. But the incident happened so fast that there was some information that I just couldn't provide. The police brought out their hounds, who traced a scent for over a mile into our backwoods until the trail went cold, and nothing further was ever discovered or reported to me. To this day, I can't describe exactly who that bearded man was, or who ended his life. My family has suspected that he might have been an escaped convict, or a deranged madman, and whoever fired that shot must have been hunting him, and chose to act in that moment to save my life 
because I have no doubt the bearded man would have done some serious harm to me. Sometimes I can bring myself to feel grateful to the unseen shooter, but other days I feel cold inside and afraid, knowing that regardless of whatever my family reasons or suspects, I'll never know for sure if that person with the rifle had not actually been aiming at me. This happened a couple of days ago to me and my girlfriend. We were house-sitting for my girlfriend's dad. My girlfriend's dad lives in a rather large house in a suburban neighborhood, just outside of one of the major cities in Denmark. What I'm trying to say here is that his neighborhood isn't exactly scary or dangerous by any means, which only meant that this gave us a bigger scare than it probably would have had it been in one of the more dangerous parts of town. After coming home from buying groceries and stocking up on necessity for our weekend stay at his house, we went to the living room to lie down and have some quality time for ourselves, which we hadn't had in a long time. Now before I go any further, just let me clarify the lay of the land here. This house had a rather large living room, and a floor-to-ceiling window at the end of the room. Outside this floor-to-ceiling window is a sensor-triggered light system. As we were lying there watching TV, I get this weird feeling that something is watching me. At first, I try and shake it off, like it's no big deal, thinking to myself it's probably just because I'm in a new house, where I don't yet feel entirely at home. But as I look to my girlfriend, I see too that she is quite shaken up about something. After a few minutes of silence, she then asked me if I have the same feeling as her, like someone was watching us. I try to play it off as nothing, and I tell her that I'll just go grab a cigarette and check to see if anyone's out there, just to make her feel safer. As I turn my head towards the floor-to-ceiling window, I notice that the lights are on. Now this shakes me to my very core, and I quickly decide not to go out for that cigarette. By this time, I feel my girlfriend's hand squeezing my arm. As I turn around to her, I see her pointing at one of the windows, and outside is a silhouette of a person. My blood freezes. In that moment, I turn around and quickly grab my phone, and as I turned back, the person had disappeared. I call my parents, as I know they were out at a friend's house not too far from where we were. My dad tells me to lock all of the doors and windows, and just sit tight and wait for them to arrive. A couple of minutes go by, and nothing happens, other than me trying to get my girlfriend to calm down as I know how this affects her blood sugar levels, and I would rather not have her have a seizure while a creeper or burglar or even a murderer is walking around outside the house. The silence is then broken by the sound of windows being tampered with. At this point, I'm trying really hard not to freak out and cause any further panic. But luckily, seconds later, I hear my dad pull up outside the house. My girlfriend and I have since discussed who it might have been, and we've come up with a few possible suspects, one of them being my girlfriend's crazy mother, who has a severe mental illness. The other more possible suspect would be just a simple burglar. I don't really care who it might have been. I'm just glad whoever it was didn't manage to break in. This happened four years ago in the early hours of New Year's Day. For reference, I was 17 at the time, and I was in my senior year of high school. I was around 5'10 and weighed about 160 at the time. I lived in the suburbs. I was at a New Year's party being held by a friend of mine, whose house was a 20 minute walk away from my own. It was around 1 in the morning, and I was about to leave with another friend of mine who lived on the same block as me. My friend who was hosting the party asked me if we wanted a ride home, and in hindsight, we probably should have took him up on his offer. But our neighborhood was pretty safe, and we figured that with the two of us walking together, no one would bother us. Plus, there was probably other people at the party who would need a ride home more than we did. We said our goodbyes to everyone and began our walk home. The road was predictably empty with no one but us walking along the sidewalk, and maybe the occasional car passing by. Everything was pretty well lit, so we weren't walking in complete darkness. My friend wanted to pick up a pack of cigarettes on the way home, so we stopped off at a gas station along the way. When we got to the gas station, it was nearly empty, with only a woman at the pump filling up her car, 
and a guy outside the front of the store on his phone. We went inside and my friend bought a pack of cigarettes. We walk out of the store and my friend immediately lights his cigarette. We reach the sidewalk and we hear someone behind us yell, Hey man, wait up! We look behind us and we see the guy who was in front of the store quickly walking towards us. He looked to be in his early to mid 20s. He was around 5'8", maybe 140 pounds by the looks of him. He approached us and asked if he could get a light. My friend and I did not think much of it and he lit the guy's cigarette. The guy thanked him and we began walking away. But the guy continued to follow us, asking us where we were going. We told him that we were heading home. He said that he was at a party and he was heading back over there as he left to get some fresh air. He asked us if we wanted to come to the party. This is officially the point where red flags start going off. Why the hell would a guy in his mid-twenties ask two teenage boys if they wanted to go party with him? We told him bluntly that we didn't even know who he was. Nor did we know anyone at this party he was talking about, so we weren't going. The guy starts laughing and says that we seem like cool guys. He told us that we needed to lighten up. My friend and I told him that we were 18 and 17 to see if that would get him to leave us alone. To this, he just chuckled and said that age didn't matter to him. He had a brother who was 16, that he partied with him and his friends all the time. Jesus Christ, can this guy take a hint? I thought to myself. We were a little less than 10 minutes away from our houses, and we didn't want this creep following us all the way there. I told him firmly, Dude, we're not going anywhere with you. Now quit following us and fuck off. The guy gets livid and starts screaming at us for being unfriendly and considerate assholes, and that he was just trying to be nice. He then starts throwing racial slurs at my friend. It's probably worth mentioning by now that I'm white and my friend is black. My friend yells at him to get away from him before he cracks him in the face, and then the guy proceeded to run away from us. My friend and I look at each other in complete disgust over what happened, and spent the next five minutes walking and talking about the creepy guy. We both agreed that he was probably drunk or high from a New Year's party. Next thing we know, we hear a car behind us. It proceeded to slow down to match our pace. We see the windows roll down which revealed the guy we had just seen a few minutes earlier, with who we presumed to be two of his friends. One of which was a man probably the same age as the guy, and a woman in the back seat who had to have been in her mid-thirties. The guy tells us that we got off on the wrong foot, and then asked us once again to join them at the party. My friend and I look at each other and I whisper to him that we needed to get away from them. My friend tells him that we're not going with them and to leave us alone already. The guy was silent for a few seconds and then said, You're coming with us, one way or another. They pull over quickly and get out of the car, which caused my friend and I to immediately go into flight mode. We turn right on the side block and my friend yelled, Run to the park, we'll lose them in there. We looked behind us and to our horror, the three people were running right for us. We run into the park, and once again we look behind us, and this time they were even closer. We ran for a thick patch of trees that covered a good portion of the west side of the park, hoping to evade them. I was panicking at this point, because I couldn't see a damn thing, and I was worried that my friend and I would trip over something, and get captured by one of these sick freaks, who wanted to do God knows what with us. We hear one of them trip and fall behind us yelling, Fuck! And luckily we see light again, and we made a left onto the path. We heard more yelling behind us, and one of the guys saying, Shit! They got away! The woman yells at them to split up and search the park. We bolt towards the bathrooms, which thankfully were open, and we hide inside. We took a minute to catch our breath, as our lungs were practically burning at this point. We should have called the cops, and just hid until they got there. But at the time we were so focused on getting the hell away from those crazy people that we decided to try and make our way to the nearest exit of the park and run to my house. We waited for about two minutes. We then bolted out of the bathroom and towards the exit of the park. Shortly before we exited the park, we heard one of the guys yell from somewhere behind us that he found us and we were getting away. We looked behind us to see the guy in the distance starting to chase after us. We ran until we reached my house and I quickly opened the door and we ran inside. We both just sat there in silence, trying to regain our energy and calm down after what happened, hoping they didn't see where we ran to. 
I looked out the window several times over the course of 10 minutes, and thankfully, they never showed up again. We talked about it and we were glad that we were both okay, and that nothing bad happened to us. We were trying to figure out what they wanted from us. Did they want to kill us? Rob us? Or something worse? My friend hung around for another half hour before he insisted on heading home. He left and I went to bed. I kept thinking about what happened. I eventually fell asleep and I woke up and told my parents about what happened. They were thankful that me and my friend were okay, but were upset with us that we chose to walk home and we should have accepted the lift from my other friend or even called them and they would have come and picked us up. Regardless, we filed a police report and I gave them all the information I could. Unfortunately, we never heard anything about it again and I sometimes wonder what the hell they've been doing ever since. I really hope they never harmed another person after that. I can't express enough how thankful I am that we managed to get away from those freaks, and to this day, this incident is still the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. It definitely made me more wary of my surroundings, and I try my best to avoid situations where I would need to walk late at night, rather if I'm by myself or not. I don't know what would have happened if those people got their hands on me, but I do know one thing. I never want to meet those people again, ever again. Last year, I took a road trip in my Nissan Altima from Prescott, Arizona to New Orleans. To make a long story short, my ex-girlfriend, who was a tattoo artist, was being sued by a guy that she had once inked over an injury that he had apparently sustained during the session. She had asked me to come as a witness on her behalf as I had been there the night in question. The trip was scheduled to take me between 20 and 22 hours driving along Route 40 East. I popped in my headphones, tossed my bag in the front seat, and started driving before the newspapers had been delivered. It should be noted that the Ultima was a two-door coupe, and the only access to the back seat was by folding the front two seats forward. Rarely did I ever have more than one person in the car, and I could hardly ever place anything in the back seat. Most of the time I forgot it was even there. The first part of my trip went smoothly. Traffic was light, the weather was fine, and my playlist was keeping me entertained. And yes, I know that it might seem a bit strange that I listen to my music through headphones while driving instead of using the radio, but that's just how I choose to relax. My first pit stop was in San John, New Mexico, where I refueled and grabbed a bite to eat. Afterwards, I got back in my car popped my headphones back in, and continued on my way east. Upon returning to the car, I noticed a stale taste in the air, but I dismissed it as a lingering scent from the restaurant. I drove for maybe another hour, when I decided to pull over on the side of the road. I had to make a phone call and take a piss. By that point, I was in Texas, and on a long stretch of highway that was pretty much desert in every direction. I stepped out of the car, stretched my legs, and took a discreet leak behind a bush. And then I called my ex to make her aware of my progress, and then dropped a quick voicemail to my boss. Keep in mind this whole time I'm pacing along the side of the road, but ultimately I was facing my car. There was no one around. And even though every half minute or so another car would pass by, nobody stopped. Before I got back into my car, I put back in my earbuds. I closed the driver's side door and started up the car, fired up the AC, and was just shifting the car into drive when my passenger door slammed shut. My heart leapt into my throat and I tore my earbuds out and looked over to my right. The front seat was pushed forward and out of the corner of my eye, I noticed someone walking away from my car. I yelled, what the fuck? And spun around in my seat, immediately power locking my doors. The person walking away from my car was a short, disheveled man with thinning hair, and a jean jacket with no shirt on underneath, maybe about 50 or so years old. I watched him in my rearview mirror, staggering around like he was drunk. He walked to the middle of the road where he stopped, bent over, and then vomited all over the pavement. That's when I noticed that he was wearing corduroy pants and blue Crocs. He wiped his mouth and turned to look at me. His mouth was kind of lopsided, and he was missing a few teeth. I heard him say something, but I could barely hear it from inside the car. I dialed 911 and gave the operator an estimate of where the guy was and that he tried to get into my car. 
I watched as the guy began walking off into the desert. Hanging off his belt on his back, I noticed one of those leather pouches retail employees keep utility knives in. I told the operator he had a knife, and drove off. Whatever was going on, I didn't want to get involved and potentially get stabbed. I was so shaken up that I didn't stop again until I was running on fumes. Playing in my head over and over again how that guy had gotten so close to my car without me noticing. Where did he even come from? The next time I stopped for gas was when it hit me. I didn't smoke, but there was an empty cigarette pack in my back seat. That's why the stale taste had been in the air. He had been lying in my back seat ever since I left San John, and I hadn't even noticed. When the door slammed, he hadn't been trying to get in. He had been getting out. I had been listening to my earbuds the entire time, and I hadn't heard or noticed anything. He could have stabbed me at any point, and I would have never seen it coming. I'm not sure if he was brain damaged or strung out drunk, but whatever he was, thank goodness he didn't decide to hurt me and that he got out of my car, and I didn't end up transporting him all the way to my destination. I never found out what happened to him or what he wanted. I rarely tell this story to anyone. Most people find it hard to believe and assume that I'm just messing with them, and I wish I was. I haven't listened to my earbuds in the car since. Someone that I used to know as a child committed an act so cruel and disturbing that I wish I had never met them before in my life. My parents found a house in a poor neighborhood that was south of Washington State. When we first moved in, me and my family introduced ourselves to the neighbors, where I met some kids around my age. One neighbor, who lived two houses down, established a friendship with my mother, and they became very good friends. They were both mothers and connected with similar interests in art. The neighbor's name was Heather. Heather had two kids, and at the time they were both in high school. Their names were Sierra and Jordan, and my mom wanted me to meet them since my parents were looking around for a babysitter. She wanted it to be someone that she could trust, since the area wasn't the greatest environment for kids. After spending some time with Jordan and Sierra, I got to know them a little, and frankly, I enjoyed their company while they watched over me as babysitters. Hanging around them made me feel much more superior than the average five-year-old. Jordan was a rebel teen who would constantly get in trouble at school. My mother was not a fan of Jordan getting in constant trouble, so my mom stopped having him over. Sierra was a very kind and courteous person and began babysitting me by herself. She was a freshman in high school and needed the money. She became my childhood babysitter. She had no history of being in trouble at school or at home, so my mother gladly let her babysit me. Sarah would play board games with me, cook my favorite macaroni and cheese, and I gradually became closer to Sierra within a short span of time. My parents at the time received full-time jobs, so they asked Sierra to babysit me more, and in return, she would get paid more from my parents. She took up the offer, and I spent more time with her every day. I began to think of Sierra as one of my best friends at the time. She really did have an impact on my life, she also began working with my mom as a house cleaner. Everything was going great for me and my family overall. A couple of years go by, and I'm beginning elementary school and going into the first grade. My parents began picking me up from school, and I had less time for a babysitter. I became somewhat distant from Sierra, as she had become a junior and was now pregnant. She would sometimes come over the house and babysit me and help my mother with a few chores around the house but she became more mature and wouldn't talk to me as much as she used to. Her mother, Heather, had a severe medical condition, which caused her to have constant painful headaches that she would experience for days at a time. Heather stopped talking to my mother and became a recluse, staying inside of her house with Jordan and Sierra. Sierra's demeanor began to change as her mother's condition began to worsen, which was understandable at the time since her mother was going through a rough time. She began displaying an odd change of behavior and started getting into trouble at school. For what exactly, I honestly don't know, but it started to put a strain on Heather and Sierra's relationship, and they began to verbally fight with each other almost every day. Sierra would scream at Heather and flip out on her mom for very insignificant reasons. 
My mother caught wind of the altercations and told Sierra that she couldn't babysit me anymore, but could help her with chores when I wasn't there. One day Sierra was helping my mom clean out the basement, when she asked if she could use our bathroom. She came down back to the basement five minutes later and finished cleaning. Later that day, my mom had to use the restroom. When she walked in, she saw what looked like a diary on the bathroom sink. My mom didn't recognize it, and with curiosity, began to open the book. What was in there was absolutely terrifying, as my mother found sections of the diary which graphically talked about rape and molestation. My mom never got into specifics about what was in the diary, and still doesn't like talking about it. My mother found Sierra's name on the back of the diary, and immediately called Heather and confronted her about Sierra's diary. Heather stated that Sierra had taken cuts from one of her books, and began writing them down in her diary. Heather acted like Sierra did this all the time and it was no big deal. My mother then told Heather that Sierra was not allowed back at the house and she wasn't going to be working with her anymore. She purposely left that diary there, but for what reason? I honestly don't know. Sierra had begun to claim that my neighbor Rodney had sexually assaulted her. Everybody in the neighborhood became skeptical of Sierra's claim due to her troubled behavior and never having much interaction with Rodney. Sierra never called the police and Rodney was never questioned about the accusations. Heather's medical condition worsened even more, and as a result, she died while Sierra and Jordan were both in their senior year of high school. Sierra dropped out of high school and claimed that she would be moving to Arizona with her then boyfriend. She ended up moving out and going out to Arizona while Jordan moved in with his dad. When they left, my parents thought they would never hear from Sierra again since she had moved on with her life. A few years go by and I didn't hear anything about Sierra or Jordan, and frankly, I kind of forgot about them over the years. One day my parents talked to John, a neighbor who lived across the street. He asked my parents if they remember Sierra, and if they had heard from her since. My parents said they hadn't heard anything about Sierra since she moved. John said that he saw Sierra on the news, and that she had been arrested for child neglect. Police in Arizona arrived at Sierra's home. After she called 911 and once she found her daughter deceased, she had been collecting welfare and living in a trailer with her two children. Those kids were neglected and suffered from malnutrition as Sierra became fat and wouldn't give the children barely anything to eat. There wasn't any air conditioning in the trailer and Sierra would leave her kids in the trailer and go live at a friend's house or a boyfriend's house. She ended up going to trial in court for manslaughter and is now serving a 16-year prison sentence. I can't believe to this day that someone that my family trusted with me and was a best friend of mine for the majority of my childhood years would do something this cruel and inhumane. I wish that she never has another child in her life and never gets another dollar from welfare. Sierra, fuck you. Back in the spring of 1999, I was living in a loft apartment in Boulder, Colorado. The ceiling above my kitchen table leaked whenever it rained, and the window unit air conditioner was louder than a freight train, but otherwise it was acceptable and cozy, with a great view of the Rocky Mountains. At the time I was writing articles for a paper, and after I had finished working my shift at the hardware store, I would spend about 3 hours writing and editing my column before bed. Normally I would get to sleep by 1 or 2 in the morning. Directly across the hall from me was a second loft apartment, which had been empty for a few years, before a middle-aged woman and her cats eventually moved in. They were the only two apartments on the second floor of the building, but our doors didn't have numbers or indicators, such as apartment A or B, to distinguish the two separate residencies. I had a P.O. box and I never received any mail at home anyway, so it didn't really bother me but it did cause some confusion that I believe nearly resulted in my death. One evening I was typing away on my computer while listening to soft classical music on the radio. When I got up to refill my glass of wine, I walked past my front door and completely on a random impulse I decided to look out the peephole. I don't know what I expected to see. It was just after one in the morning after all, but sometimes you just need that peace of mind, which is exactly what I didn't get. Standing outside my neighbor's door, directly across from me, was a short, heavy-set, bald man with gloves on his hands, but no shoes on. 
I remember spotting his gray socks against the dark wooden color of the floorboards. He wore a dark green windbreaker and jeans and appeared to be testing the knob of my neighbor's door. I remember the sensation of my heart skipping a beat. I had no idea who this man was. I had never seen him before in the building. But it was his actions more than his appearance that made me uneasy. It was clear that he was trying to be very quiet. He had no key, but was cautiously turning the knob back and forth to see if it was unlocked. I stared at him suspiciously for perhaps 30 to 40 seconds, concentrating very hard on keeping quiet. Aware that if he got the door open, I may have to run and find my phone to call 911. After another few moments, he released her knob and bent down to open a gym bag by his feet that I hadn't noticed before. I caught a side view of his face, and he looked older than I had initially expected. Suddenly noticing his face made me nervous for some reason, and I began to feel my palms starting to sweat. Realizing I still had my wine glass in my hand, I took a careful step away from the door and set my glass down on the table. I returned to the door, both hands carefully pressed against the wood, as if making to reinforce it. I peered out through the peephole again. My blood froze. The man was looking directly at my door, standing completely still, a look of suspicion in his dark eyes, and a crowbar clutched in his left hand. My heart began pounding so loud on my ears, I was convinced that the stranger could probably hear it. The kind of peephole the door had didn't really work only one way, like most of them do nowadays. It just kind of frosted outside of the glass to blur the view of whoever was inside. All the lights in my apartment were out except for my desk lamp. When I stepped away from the door, had he seen the lamp shining through the peephole? And when I stepped back, had he noticed the small pinprick of light vanish? I felt sweat begin to form on the back of my neck as the man took two steps forward and jiggled my knob, which was securely locked. I forced myself to stay put, worried that if he made to break in, even with my full weight on the door, I wouldn't be able to prevent him from getting in. The man jiggled the knob twice more, and I was terrified by the fact that we were so close together. Had the door not been there, he would have been able to feel my breath on his skin. I watched as the man again looked up at the peephole. I remember his blue eyes feeling cold, savage, and malicious. I just knew that he intended to cause me or my neighbor harm. That's when the unthinkable happened. He knocked softly three times on my door, and I heard him whisper, Open it. There was no way he could have known for sure that I was there. I imagined he was trying to get a reaction in case someone was standing there, but I was legitimately too terrified to move or speak. In fact, I was barely breathing. It's clear to me that's what he was doing, because when I had been across the room at my computer, there was no way I would have heard that knock. It was a direct threat to whoever was close enough to hear it. The man stood there for maybe another 10 seconds, then he grabbed his bag and headed down the stairs barely making any noise on the wood, thanks to him not having shoes on. I remember being too afraid to turn my back on the door, terrified that he was bluffing and that he would come back upstairs at any moment. I made myself count to 20 and then I took a deep breath, walked across the room to my desk and picked up my Nokia cell phone and called the police. Whispering the entire time, I informed the operator that there was a suspicious man right outside my apartment door but I had barely spoken for a full minute when she informed me that a squad car was already en route to that address. I happened to glance out the window, and I noticed the bald man was standing on the sidewalk beneath me. When he saw me peeking, he waved a hand up at me and then disappeared across the street into an alleyway. I nearly choked on my breath and told the operator exactly where the man had gone. When the police arrived an agonizing slow few minutes later, they searched the alleyway before coming up to interview me and my neighbor. She had called the police a few minutes before I had, because she had seen the shadows of feet coming from under her door in her dark apartment, thanks to the light in the hallway. She revealed that she was in the witness protection program, and before the morning came, she and her cats were taken away by two men in FBI jackets, and I never saw her again. I went to the station the following day and provided a description of the man to a sketch artist, to this day, I'm not positive the stranger was specifically looking for my neighbor, 
but if I had to guess, I would say it wasn't just a burglar looking to rob us. My theory was that because there was no numbers on the doors, he wasn't sure which apartment was hers, and therefore tested both. When he wasn't sure which apartment to break into, he decided to play it safe and leave. To the best of my knowledge, they never caught him. I have nothing but my own personal suspicions, but I suspect my neighbor may have had something to do with the ongoing trial of Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang. When she had spoken to the police, I noticed her Boston accent, and a year later it was all over the papers how Whitey and his gang member associates were being charged with multiple murders and colluding with a crooked FBI agent named John Connolly. The following day, I added three more locks to my door. I never saw that man or anyone else suspicious outside my door again. I lived there for another four years, and that second apartment was never rented again. This past August, I picked up a lot of side jobs house-sitting, while working at a ranch that gave horseback riding lessons. The families were all very nice and it paid well. This past November, I was house-sitting for a family and watching their Labrador retriever named Maggie while they were on vacation. They lived in a very nice neighborhood on the outskirts of a small town. The house was on the far end of the neighborhood, and thick trees flanked the backyard, and a dirt road ran behind the trees. I accidentally went down the road the first time, and tried to find the house, but there wasn't much down there, just an abandoned house with lots of deer in the front yard, and a small run-down ranch house. The first night, everything was great, but the second night, not so much. I had this weird feeling a few hours before I went to bed, but I wrote it off as spending too much time reading creepy stories on Reddit. I made sure all the doors were locked, blinds were closed, and I went to bed just after midnight. But as I fell asleep, I still couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. Maggie usually sleeps with me, but that night she just followed me up the stairs and to the bedroom, and then just sulked back downstairs. At 2.26 a.m., Maggie woke me up by standing next to the bed and whining. I had just let her out before I went to bed, and I was pretty sure she didn't have to go to the bathroom. I rolled over and hoped that she would stop, but she didn't. I gave in soon enough, and as I climbed out of bed, I realized that the house was freezing cold. I followed Maggie downstairs to the kitchen. All the doors to the house were weird. You can't open any of them from the inside or outside without a key. Not to mention this was a very heavy door, not the kind that just gets blown open by the wind. The only thing that eased my mind was that Maggie didn't seem ready to kill an intruder, and she'll usually at least bark at you. So I did a quick look around. I was too scared to do anything more. Nothing seemed out of place. The owners often left credit and debit cards, as well as wads of cash lying on the counters, and it was all there. If anyone was going to steal something, it was right next to the door, in easy pickings. But since nothing was missing, I tried to brush it off as just forgetting to lock the door. I made sure it was locked this time and went back to bed. Maggie still didn't want to sleep with me and went back downstairs. Less than an hour later, she woke me up again. This time, I didn't question her. I crept back downstairs more cautiously than I had before. The back door was open again. This time, the key that had been sitting on the kitchen counter was in the lock. Someone had been in the house with me. The police were called. They looked all around the house but found no one. Everything of value was still in place, so I was really worried about the intentions of whoever broke in. The family was shocked that something like that happened and have since moved to a large farm 20 minutes away and now have video surveillance. There's always a reason to be afraid.